Spread the Fire fam, welcome back to SMWX and we have a two-part conversation for you with the brilliant Lukona Mguni. He's a political analyst. You may have seen his work on Power FM. And in this episode, which is broken into two parts, we dived deep into South African politics, looking at the ANC, the DA's recent statements about a potential partnership with the ANC. We also looked at the 2022 elective conference. But after that, and in part two, and I must say this is a really interesting section of our conversation, we looked at what would South Africa look like beyond the ANC? Because ultimately, we need to start appreciating that that's a serious possibility and we need to start thinking about it. And Lukona gave his thoughts after an SABC interview where he said that South Africa and especially the younger generation in South Africa needs to start imagining this country beyond the ANC. So I hope you enjoy, like, share, subscribe, comment down below, and make sure you help SMWX get past 20,000 subscribers. We're on the road to 20,000. So hopefully we get there. Thank you for watching. Enjoy. Aye ye. Spread the fire. Welcome back to part two with political analyst Lukona Mguni. We had a really fascinating conversation in part one about the dynamics of South African politics. If you watched part one, you'll see that we finished our conversation just on some of the provincial dynamics in the ANC, and we're going to get to that in part two. So you were, you were making a really interesting point about 2022 and that provincial dynamics have to have to be taken into account. So. Uh, I'm going to allow you to carry on on the provincial dynamics and then I'm going to come in because and then I think we must move away from the ANC because we'll end up we can do five hours just on this um, but I have I have something on on these provincial dynamics as well so let me let me I'm, I'm interested to hear your view on this so you know the provincial dynamics are going to be very important in deciding the future of the ANC mm. And we are starting to see provinces where we thought they were fairly homogeneous in terms of their political arrangements, their political interests, and their outlook on the national issue. So when I was watching uh, Jackson Mtembo's funeral and the mask incident happened, mm. and uh, Deputy President Mabuza asks uh, the Premier of Mpumalanga, where, where is the mask? and she continues to confidently walk to her seat. I read that beyond the, the, the mask and I actually put up a tweet and said, hey, you know, this mask thing seems simple, but it will actually end uh, to an extent, as we would say, in political tears. Mm. And I think the premier <clears throat> is starting to assert her power in Pumalanga, Premier Refilo in Tsuenetipan, is starting to assert her power in Pumalanga and the four MECs that she's removed from her cabinet appear to be sympathizers of the deputy president. Now, you'll also know that Mpumalanga is the only province that lost a chairperson that never went to a provincial general council to determine a leadership. Mm -hmm. And that in part is because the deputy president was trying to still have some hold over the province. But that hold is starting to significantly wane and lose its grip to tell the truth. So there are all these arrangements and rearrangements that are happening. And as a result, we are not so sure as to who will emerge as the leader, whether the premier will be successful in using her seat in office and distribution of patronage to win yeah. over uh, you know, her adversaries or those who are mobilizing against her will be successful. You go to the Eastern Cape. So I mean, do Uti, we won't have um, Unity coming out as the candidate in 2022. No, 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 no there'll be no candidate <laughs> Unity. <laughs> no, there, there'll be no candidate Unity in Bumalanga this time around, partly because there is no provincial leader who's going to be trying to use the province to bargain for their stake in the top leadership of yeah, the absolutely, AMC. Absolutely, absolutely. So I don't think there'll be a provincial leader who will be in the top six from Bumalanga, for example. Mm. So as a result, uh, this co comrade unity we saw in 2017 uh, led me to actually write an article a week before 
uh, the conference in Nazareth uh, in the mm -hmm. Sunday Times, and I said, given all the dynamics and what is happening, it seems there's only one person who's currently guaranteed the position, and that's mm -hmm. David Mabuza to become mm -hmm. deputy president. Mm -hmm. Because he had bargained so well and used his force of strength in the province so strategically that, in fact, all sides could give him a place. And because of this mystery of having refused to pronounce on a preferred candidate between the two front runners ahead of Nasdaq. So that was important. But it won't be there this time around. That luxury is not there. Mm -hmm. You've got a province that is interestingly at odds with itself now, and that is the Eastern Cape. And yet that province appeared quite homogeneous in its outlook, at least, of yeah. the national question in terms of the leadership of the ANC. Mm. The departure of MEC of health, uh, Cindy Swakomba, mm. seems to have opened up a variety of other kinds of wares for the premier, because now the premier must explain how he was accepted into his master's program. There is a letter floating around. Uh, written to at least purportedly signed by the premier at the time he was provincial secretary, uh, signed to MEC Gomba, who was councillor at the time in the Buffalo City municipality, mm -hmm. and saying, you know, uh, alluding to issues around the procurement of the Nelson Mandela funeral. So, what is happening? Because there is this uh, PR pressure to appear as doing something. Mm -hmm. So people remove certain individuals who are alleged in corrupt or wrongdoing, and they ask them to step down, and of course they, they remove them from power. But the manner in which they do it is in a manner that antagonizes these people, makes them feel as if they are being sacrificed mm -hmm. at the expense of the truth that is known to all of them. So it, slowly what starts happening Comrades turn against each other. And as comrades turn against each other, it becomes a gain for other comrades who may provide a home for this particular individual and a mm. promise for a comeback in terms of political office, which of course comes with money and power and all these other things. And of course, we can do this for all the provinces. We you see in the Northwest, uh, the premier's membership from the ANC is said to be suspended. Yeah. Because some people are, are, are somewhat aggrieved with how he is conducting himself and the things that he has been saying and all of this. So and, and it's not got, clear why a, this membership is. A weak structure there, which is a patch patch together of, of two different groupings. Because you are trying to forge but, this false unit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you know which, which, province, which province I'm interested in as well. Before I get onto onto my this other question is yeah. Limpopo because it has now come out as the second largest province in the, in the party according to the membership numbers. Remember that was I think it was in Pumalanga before twenty seventeen. So Limpopo has now risen to a very important place ahead of twenty twenty two, and there again you had a lot of VBS scandals uh, destabilizing. So, so that's also a very interesting, but but also some report uh, support for Ramaphosa. So that could be a very interesting province to watch as well. Very interesting province to watch, uh, but I think for President Ramaphosa, it seems as if uh, the, the 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 political schisms that are in that province mm. are still, to one way or the other, on his favor. Mm. Uh, partly because I think you know someone who said to potentially become the next chairperson, the MEC for health, for example, uh, Poppy uh, Ramatuba. She, she's very clear. Uh, even in parliament, she said it. Uh, we, we, we are the Tuma minions. And uh, <laughs> we, we are ready to, to do whatever uh, mm. in the service of the president. So it seems mm. as if uh, the divisions uh, there are still along people who support him. However, mm. as we mm. know with division, they can easily sway people to the other side because people might be threatened as to, well, if this one takes over as Jefferson, I stop being premier, I stop being MEC, they'll come up with their own people. And of course, there are all other developments and deployments, particularly to local government, as we are now faced with the local government elections sometime this year, mm -hmm. uh, if they are not postponed. So 
I, I think uh, Limpopo still holds for the president, but it might be much more fragile than it was mm -hmm. in 2017. Because you'll remember that already in 2017, there were pockets of Limpopo that did not support the president. Mm -hmm. We were very clear mm -hmm. that they stand with NTZ. And of course, uh, it's important to say the fight now for me is not really about, you know, NDZ factions and CR factions. I think we need to start giving these new reconfigurations mm. names mm. that actually present what is currently underway within the ANC, which at times, yes, it is uh, bended around the broad umbrella of RET, uh, but even that on its own doesn't fully capture the moment where the ANC finds itself. But I do think as time goes by, um, uh, terminology will crystallize to understand uh, exactly these factions by name and what they stand yeah. for and what they are. So, so let me put this to you, um, Lukona, because I think this is something that we need to, to start thinking about. Because as we go to 2022, right, the common assumption is that firstly, there will be a conference, that that conference will be legitimate and that the outcome of that conference will be legitimate. What we've seen in successive ANC conferences, however, is that increasingly conferences become ambiguous. Their constitution and the legitimacy of their constitution is questioned and the outcomes are questioned. Now, up until this point, the party has managed to just by the skin of its teeth in 2017, because remember there was talk that even the outcome of 2017 would be challenged in court. The party has managed to surmount those legitimacy challenges to its own internal processes. I wonder, however, when I look at the structural weaknesses in the provinces, which are, you know, many of which don't even have permanent structures. When I look at the structural weaknesses in the leagues, where many of them, you know, don't have permanent structures. I think the Women's League is probably, funnily enough, one of the strongest structures in the ANC right now. I look at, I, firstly, I, I struggle to see how provinces can defend the legitimacy of the outcomes of their, of their internal processes. And then I worry about the legitimacy of 2022 itself. And I think if we have a very close election, we might see the first the first time where an ANC conference is actually challenged in the courts and, the, and, and there's a whole lot of ambiguity about what the outcome even is after December 2022. No, absolutely. absolutely. And there's a reason for that. The, the ANC has never been a perfect organization. It has always been a contested organization. Mm. Even when people are aggrieved in the ANC, they've always tended to lower themselves, submit themselves to the organization, mm -hmm. and bury the hatchet as it were. Yeah. And what made this possible was because at that time, the, the, the position of the ANC was one of strength, mm -hmm. both in society and in government. Mm -hmm. The pie was probably large enough for everybody to share in the spoils of power. What is happening now is that the slices of the pie are becoming thinner mm. and they are fast disappearing from the table as well. <laughs> and for this reason, the contestation in the ANC will continue to become toxic because only a few can now possibly ascend mm. to power. So when you are in coalition in Johannesburg, in the city of Johannesburg, uh, one MMC must be from the IFP, one mm. MMC must be from COPE. That, that's a slice that used to belong entirely to the organization. And it has implications in terms of who gets appointed into political office in the MMC's office, uh, perhaps some influencing on strategic projects, where they go, questions mm. of procurement and so on. So this thinning of the political gains of the ANC in the electorate, yeah. has in actual fact led it to a very difficult position where contestation of power is now about both material desires of certain leaders. And for that reason, there are fewer people who are able to lower themselves and submit themselves to the ANC, because if they do that, they almost accept defeat 
and maybe removed from the tabletop mm. uh, where mm. these gains and spoils of power are being shared. Now, this provides a real um, question. It's an existential question for some leaders now because it affects their livelihoods directly. Mm. Because some leaders also are aware, away from politics, they might not even be employable. <laughs> they might have thought in, on the permanency of the ANC so mm. much that they thought they could be members of parliament for a lifetime. And they would be guaranteed an income by virtue of being part and parcel of the elite in the ANC. Now, there's no guarantee of that nature because the spoils are becoming thinner. We are now faced with local government elections where there could be more coalition governments mm -hmm. across the country, even as much as in the city of Etiquini, for example. These things have a tendency to get to the political party's fabric and create much more toxicity because if I am not in leadership, then I can't stand a good chance to be deployed. Whereas it didn't matter whether you were in the REC or in the PEC, because there was just so much to go around, as many people could benefit uh, in the deployment of uh, various cadres of the movement to perform duties within the state broadly. Now, that then affects not only the legitimacy of the future conferences of the AA, it also affects the viability of the ANC as a governing party in this country. Mm. Because mm. if that toxicity within the political party is allowed to brew and ferment itself, when it ripens, it could be to the detriment of the party because we have always said it appears the ANC is unable to separate the party from the state. And so if we accept that the ANC's greatest governance problem has been the intertwinement of the ANC with the state, it means that toxicity in the ANC mm -hmm. will by de facto have spillover effects and introduce toxicity in the state. And of course, today we've read, we just recapped on some of these issues when you mm. deal with the question of the Scorpions, uh, when you deal with the question of corruption, when you deal with problems of procurement, when you deal with deployment of people who are not fit for purpose to positions that they do not belong into, and all other uh, malfeasance and maladministration that has visited us as a country by way of the ANC being in the state. All these contracts that have been channeled to various companies who then become keepers of politicians, who then become keepers of Lutuli House, and monies are sent there. Mm. More toxicity in the ANC equals to more toxicity in the state, and that equals a serious threat to the democracy of South Africa. Well, I think for that reason, um, another thing that you mentioned in, in your recent SABC interview was the need, and I think it was quite a brave statement to go on the public broadcaster and say this, is the need to start thinking beyond the ANC for South African citizens, for us to really start to imagine what the country looks like beyond sole dependence on, on the ANC. And I think we need to start having these conversations in public much more because we need to start looking at what what that looks like um take me through how you how you came to such a bold statement and what you think south africa after the anc why south africa needs to start thinking past the anc well i mean i've been uh, thinking about this for some time now um in fact a friend of mine i met in august 2012 one of the things i said to him was if the ANC is in power beyond 2019 in this country, we will have serious troubles. And I think uh, it's becoming quite visible to me uh, why I may have thought that way. There is a reason across all organizations, by the way, where we have either worked or studied, 
uh, why there is a change of leadership. Just now at an abstract level, there is a reason why uh, some people feel after they've been CEOs for 10 years, they can't do it anymore. They've got to go find other you know, challenges and things that you know, interest and stimulate their minds differently and, 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 and take up new uh, adventures in life. There is a reason why in our universities, the vice chancellors don't last beyond X number of terms. Uh, you, you can look around. The only place where there is a level of permanency is the family structure. My grandmother, who turns 90 soon, uh, she's still the grandmother of that family. Instead, she becomes the great grandmother. So she's quite permanent. There's no democracy to shuffle her and remove her from the helm of the family and then uh, <laughs> install another person from another generation. So in the family mm -hmm. space, there is quite a degree of permanence. And this is why monarchical governments are a problem because they adopt the logic of family and extend it to the public life of an entire nation. And this is why we tend to run away from them. So what has happened in South Africa over the years since 1994 is the permanency of the ANC. Now, people will argue that the ANC changes its leadership, but the reality is that the ANC, the logic of the ANC itself is permanent. And quite frankly, and if, if you look at the leaders, I mean, they've been playing musical chairs. Yes, they changed, oh, but Ramaphosa has been there since the 90s. Zuma has been there since the 90s. Absolutely. Uh, the likes of Tito Mboweni anyway, were ministers of late by 1994, became governors, they are ministers today. Uh, the likes of Togo Didiza have been uh, permanent features of the governance. Uh, Lindwe Sisu, Louis. You, you can name them. Potentially, Yonaledi Pandos. I mean, you, you can name them, all of them. They have been there since day one. All that happens is that uh, they wait to be very aged and then decide to go home or they wait for the inevitable uh, passage of life through our, our mortality um, <laughs> and they succumb to death. Now, th this, is, this is a problem because mm. in literature, of course, political science literature, we also read about the problems of a one-party dominant state. Now, it is not to say you are under a dictatorship, but you are under this party that is so dominant that even elections have become a formality. Elections have become a routine and a political rite of passage to re-legitimate this one political party back into office. This becomes a quasi-dictatorship that is brought about through democratic means, in my view. Now, this, by the way, issue of dominant parties has become problematic in America. The dominance of two political parties, where people say, at least you've got a choice between this one and that one. But people say, yeah, it's red and it's blue, but in essence, it's almost one in the same. Uh, unless there are extremes, of course, of like Donald Trump and so on. But it's, it's mm -hmm. almost one in the same. It doesn't give a multi-party democracy room to breathe. Uh, you go to the UK, for example, and at some point when they were really tired of this, uh, Nick Clegg's party then uh, made some gains. And of course, there was a coalition government uh, between the conservatives and uh, uh, the, 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 the... I'm forgetting his political party now. Liberal Democrats, um, yeah. Yeah, the in the United Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, in, 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 in the UK. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, that was an important statement, by the way, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a country where the, 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 the Conservatives and, 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 and the Labour Party have always been the two political parties that change power. So this idea of dominance is important for us to interrogate, not only at an abstract level, but because it overly embeds the tendencies of one political party into the entire logic of the state, its mm. bureaucracy, its institutions, and how it functions. And when that dominant political party becomes devoid of ideas, devoid of morality, devoid of ethics, devoid of uprightness, those tendencies visit themselves to the state. So I'm attempting to say, and I've been saying this for a while, the ANC as a political party has reached a cul-de-sac. It has no, there's no room for it to redeem itself. There's no room for it to reinvent itself. I'm not convinced that there is. What keeps the ANC in power is the residual effects of that dominance. 
it is too broad and big an elephant. So you eat it in chunk sizes. You eat it in chunk sizes. But it's almost inevitable that given where the ANC is, the ANC will lose power. However, because of how broad and dominant it has been, it has become part of South Africa's cultural repertoire, at least its political cultural repertoire. And for that reason, many people, even those who are disappointed by the ANC and decide to stay at home and not participate in the polls, do not imagine life without the ANC. So when you begin to talk about South Africa beyond the ANC, one is to begin to prepare the psyche of society to see this as a material possibility. Mm -hmm. And if it is indeed a material possibility, they must contend with that possibility, get used to that possibility and become okay with that possibility. Because if you don't do that, you risk a situation wherein the ANC loses power, but there is social resistance to that electoral outcome. There is mm. questioning of the legitimacy of that electoral outcome because in the psyche of many people, it never dawned on them that the ANC could lose power. And they would be contesting, not because there is material effect or materiality to their complaints on the electoral process. They would simply be compla complaining because you are disturbing what has become their political culture as a country. And mm -hmm. culture, of course, as you would know, is something that we guard and safeguard jealously because it extends to our heritage, it extends to our identity, and eventually mm -hmm. it extends to our being in the very space of life that we call the society where we exist. So, this idea of South Africa beyond the ANC needs a lot of work, not yeah. simply because you are decampaigning the ANC. It has nothing to do with that. You sure. are just using your eye, your third eye, to see that in future, indeed, the ANC might lose power. But you are worried that society is not well prepared for that eventuality. And that's where yeah. it becomes important to talk about. You know what what she says is, is very interesting because I, I think I think of this moment at, at the state capture commission where President Zuma effectively says, I, "I'm not I'm not going and I don't care." And you can think what you want about that, but what happens when the ANC says, "No, no, no, these electoral outcomes are your law. Our law is our law is where we're staying where we are, and you will have to remove us if you want to." And and so, yes, we need to be prepared for, for a moment like that, if, if it does come. And also what you say, and we, I suppose we can end here, much as I would love to keep you for five hours, but we'll have to get you back. I'm gonna get everyone in the comments, just comment if you think Lukona must come back and then, and also tweet him, tweet him and say he must go back for another round on, <laughs> on SMWX. Um, but, so there's that worry is how would the ANC itself take losing power? Because it's all well and good to say in theory we'll be fine. But when it happens in practice, will they really um, accept it? The other thing is, I think it's great. It, it, it gives me great hope, but it, it also gives me great fear because the hope in me says we, especially our generation, needs to find each other at some point and start saying, well, if the ANC falls, what do we replace it with? You know, and, and, and can we replace it with something that lives up to the ideals um, of our generation and many generations better than what the ANC has done? And that's, that's an exciting project. The other alternative is that the ANC loses power, but, but it doesn't mean South Africa becomes a better and a freer place. It means that there's an ANC DA coalition and the status quo really remains. Or, or there's an ANC EFF coalition. And even though no one party, you know, so even though no one party governs, that doesn't mean that the political system changes. And we might go through a period if, we, if we're not wise, where the ANC loses power, but power doesn't lose power. 
that's, a, that's an important point and it needs time. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Safe, safe to say, safe to say, if the trends we have been seeing of late are anything to go back, wherein the ANC partly loses power because those who used to support it no longer turn up for elections. Mm. In your case of scenarios, there is another extreme and worrisome scenario. Mm. Wherein the people who no longer partake in the electoral process become far more larger mm. in number than the people who participate in the electoral process. Because currently the, the, the votes that the ANC gets are equivalent to about plus minus 35% of the entire voter aged population. So people who are 18 plus who are eligible to vote. Only 35%. And yet in, in the books, it says that's 57% of the electorate, mm -hmm. at least those who have turned out. Now that's important because it is telling you that the electorate process is beginning to lose legitimacy in the eyes of some people for a variety of reasons. Others no longer trust politicians. Others of course are held back by this political culture I'm talking about of not seeing themselves vote for anything but the ANC. Others are worried that, you know, politics is not the way to go. We can find solutions outside of the political landscape. But the reality remains, for as long as political parties are part and parcel of running the state, politics will continue to matter. Now, to a point you touched on, it's important that independent candidates are going to be allowed to participate in provincial and national elections. But that could easily still pose you problems. What happens in a parliament of 400 MPs and you've got 250 independents who have 250 independent motives, mm. politics, and aspirations? Mm. And they all mm. want to be president. Mm. And that could lead you to a systemic collapse of parliament. And you might need to rerun elections and so on. So there are no perfect answers. But what is quite clear Preparing society for life beyond the ANC at a psyche level is important. But the second part that is important mm. is that this eventuality might happen even if we do not plan for it. And that comes in the threat. If we don't plan for it, mm. the country, when the ANC collapses and disintegrates away from government, the country could disintegrate more because there will be such a scramble for power mm. among bodies that no, no, don't really carry, as you say, the correct aspirations for our generation and future generations to come because we must be futuristic in our approach. So the second layer that is important in this preparation for life without the ANC, and this is why I laugh because I find the DA's conversation about coalitions and realignment really constrained to the current, uh, mm. currently available political players. Mm. I have mm. no doubt that my generation and other generations who are truly, truly committed to this country, passionate about its revival, passionate about its uh, re-emergence from the crisis that it finds it itself, convicted on the prescripts and the ethos of our social contract in the constitution, even if it is not perfect, but convicted that that is the baseline which we must act from. And probably taking lessons from across the globe as to what it means to run a country, what it means to develop people, what it means to give people happiness. There is nothing such as governance that equates to happiness and well being of its people. Not these idealistic issues of you must just be employed. You can be employed in a very draconian system mm. that doesn't give you happiness. Once you start making happiness and well-being as part of your governance ethos, it means your policies, your activities as government 
be it at a different level than just mechanically delivering employment, mechanically delivering schools, you've got to ask yourself in this day and age, how do I build this? I mean, in one country, uh, there's just been an appointment of a minister of loneliness because uh, there is an understanding that citizens under COVID-19 are becoming somewhat lonely. Now, mm. how, you need a minister of loneliness to, 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 to respond to the problems of society at that moment. Now, the last issue I will leave you with is this. Maybe that's the ministry the DA will take up in the, in the new coalition. <laughs> and probably it will just, DA, it will serve its DA members because they'll be <laughs> feeling left out of the national project. <laughs> now, hmm. we have to, hmm. Hmm. as a principle level, as a moral obligation, and as our commitment to meet the future where we, we deserve to meet it, it is our duty that we ought to begin conversations on. What is the prototype of a political party that needs to govern this country? What are the ingredients that must go into building that political party? What type of people should it attract? And what type of political momentum should it give to the country? And once we've answered those questions, we must found that political party. Hmm. We, we have no other commitment to the future far greater than that one. It's an important commitment that we must make to ourselves, to each other as peers, and to our children. Because if we don't do that, when our children read history books, they will say that at the generation of 1912, in fact, they'll go to the 1800s and deal with people like Oma Koma, um, and, and others who fought and resisted the frontier wars. They will go to the Bambata rebellion. They will go to the formation of the African National Congress. They will go to the breakaway of the Pan-Africanist Congress. They will go to the Sharpeville massacre. They will go to 1976. They will remind you of other struggles of labor in the mines that predate the formation of some political party. They, they will take you to the beer hall boycott. They will take you to moments in history where women marched to the union building. They will take you to the 1980s, the founding of the United Democratic Front, making South Africa ungovernable. People sacrificing their lives to mobilize against the apartheid system and ensure that there is international solidarity and support. There is disinvestment, there's boycott, and there's all sorts of things happening. They will take you to the 1990s and they will say, then you were born. We don't see you in the history pages about securing the future of this country. That scares me because I would not want to face my children in the eye as they ask me, why did you bring me to this world if you were not willing to secure my place in the world? And that is a generational question we must confront. We must elevate ourselves to it because it is indeed quite a high calling. It is indeed quite a moment for sacrifice. It is indeed a moment where we will make such statements and some people will say, well, these guys are actually political. They're, they're not commentators. They are not this, they are not that. Therefore, maybe they must no longer be used. We must be fine with that. But we must meet our generational question and we must meet our future where we deserve to meet our future. And we will only do that if we secure the future today and we ask the right questions about our future, but not only theorize, be willing as many who have come before us who sacrificed their careers, 
who sacrificed their intellectual development, who sacrificed their families in service of a future they felt they deserved. And if they did not act, they would not be able to meet the future that they deserve. And when we talk about this South Africa beyond the ANC, it has serious implications for our lives, for our choices, for our families, for our careers, and indeed for our country. Well, I'm not going to say anything uh, more. I think that's the perfect note on which to leave it. And it's something that I think everyone watching needs to meditate on. It's something I need to, to think about as well, because you're right. At the end of the day, if we don't step up, um, then we can't expect anything different. So uh, I thank you for that admonition and for that rousing closing. And if you agree, comment down below with Lucona. And uh, bro, thanks so much for, for joining SMWX, for giving your analysis. Only a pleasure to finally be here. Indeed, indeed. And uh, I'm hoping that people will peer pressure you into coming back one of these days. <laughs> Absolutely. No, we'll make the time. We'll make the time. Mm. Thanks so much. Aye.